Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to Berean Bible Church. We've been periodically studying the Olivet Discourse. You know, here and there, I've been sticking in uh, sections of it. Well, we're going to, since we're not in a book right now, we finished 1 John. Before we get into 2 John, I'm going to finish this thing on the Olivet Discourse. Chapter 24 of Matthew is a very important chapter. I think, in fact, it's the heart of New Testament prophecy. We have seen that looking at this text through first century eyes gives us a whole new meaning of Yeshua's words. Yeshua is not talking to us in this chapter, us being 21st century Americans or whatever, kins, okay? But to his disciples, first century Jews, that's who he's talking to. And things that were future to them at the time of the writing are ancient history to us. This whole discourse is concerned with answering the disciples' questions concerning the end of the Jewish age, not the world, and the parousia of Christ, both of which would be demonstrated by the destruction of Jerusalem and the Jewish temple. Now, the majority of Christendom looks for a future second coming of Christ. But according to Yeshua's own words, all these things took place in this generation, Yeshua's generation, the one he was speaking to in AD 70, the Lord came in power and great glory and was manifest, his coming was manifest by the destruction of Jerusalem. The coming on clouds all throughout the Tanakh had the idea of judgment. He came in clouds against Jerusalem, it was judgment. And the heavens and the earth of the old covenant Israel passed away. And we talked about that last time. In the new heavens, in the new earth of the new covenant, the church were consummated. Now, among those who are partial preterists, which are really futurists, there's a great deal of agreement with all I've said so far in the interpretation of Matthew 24, 1-35, be the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. But among these same preterists, a debate arises over a proposed shift in topics and errors with verse 36. They see verse 36 as being a time transition verse. And I think if you look real close, you can see it in the white spaces, because I don't see it anywhere else, all right? I'm giving away my hand here, so you know where I'm, with the way I'm going. But the, the debate concerns whether Christ dealt with two issues in this chapter, the destruction of Jerusalem, verse 1 through 35, and the end of the world, verse 36 and following. Or did he deal with just one, that being the destruction of Jerusalem and the end of the Jewish age? All right, he says in verse 36, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. They didn't know the day or the hour of the Lord's coming, but they knew it would be in their generation. Now, we said a generation is 40 years, so they knew within this 40 year period it's going to happen. They said, well, you, and you talk to people and they'll say, you talk about the coming of the Lord in 80 said, Well, the Bible says no one knows the day or the hour. Yeah, we do know it now. They didn't know it then, but they knew it was in that generation. They seem to miss that part. J. Marcellus Kick writes this in his commentary on Yeshua's Olivet Discourse and Eschatology of Victory. He says, Many have recognized that with verse 36, a change in subject matter occurs. Charles Haddon Spurgeon indicates this in his commentary in verse 36 of Matthew 24. There is a manifest change in our Lord's words here, which clearly indicate they're referring to His last great coming to judgment. Now, Kenneth Gentry, author of many helpful works on prophecy, takes a similar view. They say in verse 36, this thing is shifting, and he's going in a different direction. So let me ask you, is it a big deal if Matthew 24 can be divided or not? Yeah, it really is. It's absolutely a big deal. If this chapter is only dealing with the first century fulfillment, which I believe it is, then the futurists have no text to indicate a future coming of Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. He has to admit that the parousia of Christ was a first century spiritual event which keeps intact all the, keeps intact all the eminent time statements made concerning His coming. And this is a text that many will go to and say, yeah, there's another coming, and they're going to use verse 36 and following. Well, the full preterist view 
is that the second coming of Christ happened in A.D. 70. And it was a judgment. It was a removal of the old covenant system, the old heaven and earth. It was establishment fully of the kingdom, the new covenant, the new heavens and earth. He came in the first century just as he said he would. And there's no mention anywhere in Scripture of a third coming. It's not in there. Now let's look at some different arguments that demonstrate that this chapter cannot be divided. All right? These are arguments that that show you you really can't divide this thing. First one, this day and that day. One of the key arguments by those who divide this chapter is that four times in three verses, Matthew 24, 19, 22, and 29, Yeshua refers to those days. However, we're told in verse 36, we have a direct contrast when Yeshua says, but of that day. Kick emphasizes this distinction. He says the expression that day and hour gives immediate evidence of a change of subject matter. Does it really? Gentry writes, we should notice the pre-transition emphasis on plural days in contrast to focus on singular day afterwards. Gentry also writes this, there seems to be an intended contrast between that which is near, verse 34, and that which is far, verse 36. This generation versus that day. Really? He's talking to them and he says, this generation, because the generation is 40 years, not over yet, it had many years to go, this generation is to not pass away, but of that day, what day? The day I was talking about that this generation is going to see. Well, personally, I think, he goes on to say, it would seem more appropriate for Christ to have spoken of this day rather than that day. No, because it wasn't happening then. He was referring to something that was future to him. He said if he had meant to refer to the time of this generation. I think that's really, really a weak argument. And I think Gentry's much more intelligent than to make a weak argument like that. Well, my position is I think that all of that is a bunch of nonsense, okay? There's nothing there. This generation refers to the present generation that she was addressing. This is therefore the appropriate word for something that's present, while that is more appropriate word for something that's future to them. Art and Gingrich agree with me. They say this refers to something comparatively near at hand, just as ekenos, that, refers to something comparatively further away. He couldn't have said of this day, because it wasn't going to happen for a while, okay? So it was that day. We saw in verse 35, we looked at it last time, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Then he says, but concerning that day, the day of heaven and earth passing away, which was quite a bit future to them at that time. These writers, Gentry, Kick, they don't believe that that day can be a reference to the fall of Jerusalem. They argue that a singular that day can only refer to something future to us, a future coming coming of Christ to us. Now, it's easy to show how wrong they are, I think, by comparing Scripture with Scripture. And remember, that's one of our principles that we want to do. We want to look at other Scriptures to see if we can see something that helps us identify that. If we go to Luke 17, and in Luke 17, verse 20, Yeshua says, it says, being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. So, context here, Pharisees are asking Christ, about the kingdom of God. That's the subject matter. All right? So in Luke 17, he's talking to the Pharisees about the kingdom, and he's telling them, when, they're asking when it will come. And he's going to tell them, but he's going to tell them when the fullness of it was coming. He's not talking about Pentecost, but he's talking about the fullness of the kingdom at the destruction of Jerusalem. Luke 17, 31, he says, On that day, not this day, This is their argument. That day refers to something future. On that day, let the one who is on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away. And likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. Here, Yeshua uses the singular expression, that day, which is clearly referring to the same situation that is spoken of in Matthew 24, 17 which those who divide Matthew 24 says it's speaking of the destruction of Jerusalem. But here he uses that day, and he's clearly speaking of the destruction of Jerusalem, not something further away. 
I think that's a pretty good argument there. Look what he says here. On that day, if you're on the housetop with his goods in the house, not come down and take them away. We see the same thing, Matthew 24, 17, on the housetop. And see, 24, 17 is in the first part that they say that's the destruction of Jerusalem. So you cannot say that day of Luke 17, 31 refers to a past event to us, and that day in Matthew 24, 36 refers to a future, when they're both speaking about the same thing. They're clearly speaking of the same event. So when Yeshua uses the expression, but concerning that day, he is still talking about the same subject. He's talking about the second coming. He's talking about the heaven and earth passing away, and he says, but concerning that day. Doesn't it make sense that those days would culminate in that day? Those days led to the passing away of heaven and earth, which is that day referred to in verse 36. Now, one of the reasons the distinction between those days and that day is seen by many commentators is because of a preconceived idea that the disciples had asked questions about two subjects, the destruction of Jerusalem and the end of time. And with this presupposition, the interpreter then sees Yeshua changing the subject in verse 36. Ken Gentry writes this, Matthew 24 is answering two questions from the disciples. They assume... The destruction of the temple means the destruction of the world. That's a huge leap, people. And I don't know where he gets that from. Okay? Because the question they ask is, is when will be the end of the age I own? Not world cosmos. So how they assume, how he thinks they assume the destruction of the temple meant the end of the world, there's no evidence for that. There's no contextual evidence that the disciples assumed that the destruction of the temple means the destruction of the world. They asked about the end of the age, not the world. And where is any evidence they had any other coming in mind other than the coming they've been talking about for 35 verses? Yeshua's coming to destroy Jerusalem in that generation. I think it's pure eisegesis to import another coming into this context. All right, so we got this day and that day. Secondly, sign, sign, everywhere, sign. This is another argument that those who divide the chapter use. They say it's the absence of signs in verse 36. They say that Yeshua gave signs in the first part of the chapter, but in verse 36, he says, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows. So he told them here, you'll see these signs, and now he's saying no one knows, so oh, they, they got to be different things. They say one day has signs, the other doesn't, therefore... It can't be the same day. North says this, He had told the disciples precisely when the destruction of Jerusalem would be, during their lifetime, and they could read the sign of the approaching army so closely that they could escape it. But His coming, no one knows when it will be, neither men, nor angels, nor Jesus Himself. You know, all of a sudden there's this change. Well, if you examine carefully all three synoptic accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you will see that Yeshua never told them that they would know the day or the hour in reference to the destruction of Jerusalem. You're not going to find it. The signs He gave them was to tell them when it would be near. When you see these signs, you know it's close. He never gave them a day or an hour. He never said on September 8th, 8070, you'll see this happen. He didn't do that. Now, a lot of people make a big deal about this that, that says no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Why didn't the Son know? Isn't He God? Well, here's what we got to understand. Yeshua as the God-man, Philippians 2 says, laid aside the prerogatives of deity. That's the doctrine of the kenosis, the self-emptying. He was God, but as He walked on the earth, He functioned in the power of the Holy Spirit, not on His deity. That's how He can be an example for us. We're to live in the power of the Spirit. He laid aside the prerogatives of His deity, one of those prerogatives being omniscience. So as a man, Yeshua didn't know the exact day or hour. Luke tells us in 2.52, and Yeshua increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. That's speaking of Him in His humanity. He's not growing as God. He's growing in His humanity. And that's what this is talking about. Now, many today use verse 36 to prove that we have no knowledge of a time of a future to us, second coming of Christ. But as we've already seen, that day refers to the passing away of heavens and earth, 
which was the destruction of Jerusalem and the Old Covenant. Yeshua had already told them in verse 34 that it would happen in their generation. So they know we've got a 40-year time span here. But they didn't know the day or the hour that it would happen. He says, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows. Now, let's talk about this for a minute. When a woman gets pregnant, we know it'll be in about how many weeks that she has a baby? Forty. Forty weeks. Forty. that ring a bell to anybody? Forty? Forty, you know. We know she can have a baby somewhere there. We don't know the day or the hour. Trust me. I've seen it happen a few times. Okay? Despite what the doctor tells you. Unless you schedule a cesarean, you know, you don't know the day or the hour. We don't know. But we can tell it's going to happen in 40 weeks. And that's exactly what Yeshua is saying here. And it's interesting that the time prior to the consummation of the kingdom is often referred to as birth pains. Birth pains. He's making an analogy here. Look at Matthew 24, 8. All these are but the beginning. These signs, he says, they're the beginning of the birth pains. Now, the Greek word translated birth pains here is odin, and it means a pain, especially of childbirth. This same word is used in 1 Thessalonians 5.3, translated labor pains. Now, concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there's peace and security, then suddenly destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman. So the illustration of gestation and childbirth is a biblical one. We know when the birth of the child is near, but we just don't know the day or the hour. Sometimes we don't know the week. Okay? John Lightfoot, in 1859, wrote this. Of what day and hour that the discourse is of our Lord, the destruction of Jerusalem, is so evident, both by the disciples' questions and by the whole thread of Christ's discourse, that it is a wonder any should understand these words of the day and hour of the last judgment. He's just saying, it's so clear he's talking about the same subject. And Nisbeth in 1787 wrote this, But though the time was hastening on for the completion of the Lord's prophecy, of the ruin of the Jews, yet the exact time of this judgment lay hid in the bosom of the Father. Verse 36, Of that day and hour knoweth no man, not the angels of heaven, but the Father only. St. Mark has it, neither the Son, but the Father, but the sense is the same. Some men of great learning and eminence have thought that our Lord is speaking not of the destruction of Jerusalem, but of the more solemn and awful one of the day of judgment. But I can by no means think that the evangelists are such loose, inaccurate writers as to make so sudden and abrupt a transition and they are here supposed, as they are here supposed to do, much less to break through the fundamental rules of good writing by apparently referring to something which they had said before when in reality they were beginning a new subject. And the absurdity of the supposition will appear more strongly if it is recollected that the question of the disciples was, when shall these things be? Why, says our Savior, of that day and hour, knows no man, not the angels nor the, uh, of heaven, but my Father only. So he's saying, look, man, this is ridiculous. It just doesn't fit grammar. It doesn't make any sense. Adam Clark, writing in 1837, said, verse 36, but of that day and hour, is translated season by many eminent critics. And it is used in the sense by both sacred and profane authors, as the day was not known in which Jerusalem should be invested by the Romans. Therefore our Lord advised His disciples to pray that it might not be on a Sabbath, and as the season was not known, therefore they were to pray that it might not be in the winter. Because they got to flee, and you don't want it to be on the Sabbath, you don't want it to be in the winter. So they knew the season, but they didn't know the day or the hour. So this day and that day, I don't think, holds any water. The sign argument I do, doesn't hold any water either. The third one, the big but argument, does the word but signal a transition? The beginning of verse 36 says, but concerning that day. So it's been said that by the use of but, it's the Greek word day, you should change the subject to something else. Stanford North says this, 
Verse 36 starts with the word but, suggesting a contrast with what has gone before. Before 34, moreover, Jesus used the plural days to refer to the, his major subject, while after verse 34, he speaks of a singular of the day. Well, does the fact that verse 36 starts with a but signal a contrast in subject matter? It absolutely does not. The word but is used here as a conjunction, not as a preposition. And as a conjunction, but, the word day, is not a word of contrast, but joins what has just been said with what is about to be said. The New Englishman's Greek concordance of the New Testament says this, the conjunctival usage of day is by far the most frequent use of the particle day in the New Testament. If the use of day at the beginning of a verse introduces a break in subject, there are eight subject changes in 24. Because this day appears in verse 6, 8, 13, 20, 32, 36, 43, and 48. And by examining the verses before 24, 36 and after, you'll see that the most common uses of but in Matthew 24 and 25 has nothing to do with changing subjects. Thomas Newton wrote in 1754, It is to me a wonder how any man can refer to part of the foregoing discourse to the destruction of Jerusalem and part to the end of the world or any other distant event. When it is said so positively here, the conclusion, all these things should be fulfilled in this generation. That's right, they'll be fulfilled then. It seemeth as if our Savior had been aware of some such misapplication of His words by adding yet greater force and emphasis to His, ap his affirmation in verse 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. All right? So, but doesn't, that doesn't hold water either. All right, verse, uh, the fourth argument here is Matthew's word for coming. I think that we can disprove that verse 36 is a transition switching to another subject by noting that Matthew uses the same Greek words for coming on both sides of verse 36. And if he's changing the subject and talking about a different coming, is he going to use the exact same words? He used the word parousia four times in 24, twice before 36 and twice after. Verse 30, uh, 24, 3, he says there, uh, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, his disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your parousia and the end of the age? So they want to know, when's it going to happen? Verse 27, For as lightning comes from the east and shines to the west, so will be the coming, the parousia of the Son of Man. And then there are two after verse 36. Verse 37 says, For as the days of Noah, so will be the coming, the parousia of the Son of Man. And then in verse 39, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming, parousia, of the Son of Man. Now, not only is parousia used on both sides of 36, but the Greek word erkomai is also translated coming on both sides. 2430, there will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. The tribes of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming, erkomai, on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And then it's used on the other side in verse 42. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know what day your Lord is coming. Erkamai. Erkamai is also used in verse 44, 46, and 50. Now some com commentators apply all three coming passages before 36 to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, and they say the same exact words used after 36 refer to a different future coming. Are there two comings of Christ discussed in this passage? Does Yeshua use the exact same words to speak of two totally different events in the same passage of Scripture? That's confusing. If he's trying to change the subject, that would be a different. One's coming in judgment, the other's coming to destroy the whole world. J David Chilton, writing in 1996, just before his death, said any proposed division of Matthew 24 into two different comings is illegitimate, nugatory, and gossamer. Scripture foretells a second coming, not a third. You got that? It's nugatory. You all know what that means, right? <laughs> nugatory means of no value or importance. How about gossamer? You know what gossamer means? Yeah, that's right. It's a fine, flimsy substance. So there's, 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 not, there's nothing to that argument. It's very flimsy. 
You got to get out, when you're reading Chilton, you get out a little dictionary to follow along. <laughs> okay? <laughs> All right, so far I've given you four arguments as to why the chapter cannot be divided. We looked at um, this day, that day, sign, sign, everywhere, sign, the word but, big but translation there, Matthew's words for the coming. And I think they're good arguments. I really think all of them are good. But I also think all of them pale in comparison to the next argument that I want to put forth. To me, this one ends the discussion and sends the dividers of Matthew 24 running. My final argument is a divine answer that ends all questions, and that's Luke 17. Luke 17 is a parallel account giving us the same signs, the same symbols. Now, Gentry, who divides this chapter, he's got to deal with Luke 17. So he comes out and he says, Luke 17 is not a parallel account. You know, it's not, well, no, I don't know if he says parallel. He says Luke 17 is not Luke's Olivet Discourse. And that's true. Luke does that in 22. But it is a parallel account because he's talking about the coming of the kingdom to the Pharisees. And he's used the same signs that we see in Matthew's Gospel. The same signs, same symbols that the, you know, they asked. All right, so Yeshua is, is using signs in Luke's account to answer when the kingdom would fully come. And it doesn't take, I really don't think it takes a brain surgeon to figure out that any attempt to apply the coming of this kingdom that Luke talks about to Pentecost is really false. Some try to do that. Some say, well, that's talking about Pentecost. No, it's not at all. The dividers of Matthew 24 assert that the first part, verses 1 through 35, can only refer to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. But the second part, verse 36 through 51, is completely different and can only be applied to the end of the world and what they call the real second coming of Yeshua. But like I said, I think a simple reading of Luke 17, 20 through 37 will reveal that according to Luke's arrangement of the signs and symbols, he only understood Christ to be referring to one event. That, that pertained to the full coming of Christ in His kingdom in AD 70. No distinction is possible when examining Luke's context. He uses signs from the first part of Matthew 24 and the second part, and he intermingles them all. Luke records the same events as Matthew, but in a different order. Here's Matthew's order. You read Matthew, he's got the signs. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, you, you read Luke, and he's got... Well, he's got two up there, and then four, and then one, and then five, and then three. So he's got them all mixed up. He has an event from section one followed by one from section two, and another from section one followed by section two, and finally one from section one. Number four, what Matthew says is a sign for number four, but he says, as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Well, Luke says that, but his number four is second in his sign. So it's before they were divided, I guess. And then with three, is on the other side of the equation. Number three is the sign for wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. And so this is a, this is a strong argument. You know, again, the way they try to get around this is to say, well, Luke's not talking about that. He uses the exact same wording. So why is he not? But they don't like it because it really destroys their argument. They're mixed up. If Matthew 24 really deals with two comings that happen thousands of years apart, then Luke made a mistake because he mixes Matthew's events up and makes them all happen at one time. The way I see it, you have one of two choices. Either you say that Luke is wrong, thus denying the inspiration, or you could conclude that Matthew 24 all speaks of one event. So which one you choose? Now think carefully. Okay? <laughs> the simple answer is that Yeshua returned in the first century just as He said He would. There's no third coming mentioned anywhere in Scripture. J. Stuart Russell said, There is not a scintilla of evidence that the apostles and primitive Christians had any suspicion of a twofold reference in the predictions of Jesus concerning the end. I agree. Okay? Not a scintilla. All right, so we looked at these five arguments. Let me give you one more argument that I think is a very strong argument, and you won't hear this from too many people, all right? And that is the festival language of verse 36. 
Now, David mentioned festival language in his reading of Scripture early this morning. Festival means relating to a feast or festival, all right? But concerning that day and hour knows no one. This language here is Feast of Trumpets language. His audience would have been very familiar with this. They were Jews. They understood the Feast of Trumpets. Trumpets is the first of the fall feast. The fall feast picture the second coming of Christ. And this is the first of the fall feast. The Feast of Trumpets, it's the only one of the seven feasts that began on the first day of the month. Why is that significant? How did they determine the first day of the month? By the moon. Okay, so you go out there and you're looking. We know pretty much when its month's going to start, but guess what? They didn't know the day or the hour because they had to be out there looking. And all of a sudden, they'd see the, the horns of the moon, and then they would run back to the Sanhedrin and report, we saw the moon. It's the first day. That was important. Because the beginning of the month was dependent upon them seeing that. But the precise timing wasn't easy to determine. I mean, if you had a bad cloudy day or bad weather, there's no moon, how do we know when to start? So no one knew the exact day or hour of the new moon's appearance. And it kept people in a continuous state of alertness. We've got to start the Feast of Trumpets on this day, but we're not sure what the day is going to be until we see the moon. They knew approximately, but didn't know the day or the hour. The Feast of Trumpets pictured judgment on Israel, but it also pictured resurrection. And Jews often will use the symbol of a trumpet on the gravestone because that pictured resurrection. The blast of the shofar, the trumpet, was a calling the believers home in the resurrection. But the trumpet, the blast of the shofar, was also blasted to call judgment upon the nation Israel. The feast is about judgment. The feast of trumpets. It's about judgment not on the world. It's about judgment on Israel. This was Israel's feast. It applied only to Israel. It was about their judgment. This is not speaking of a future judgment of the world. And when his hearers heard him talk about this, but of that day and hour, they'd be going, oh, that's the Feast of Trumpets. We don't know what day or hour it is. It's a judgment coming. They compare this with the rest of Matthew 24. They knew the judgment was coming on the nation. Again, this is not a world judgment. This judgment is to Israel. We see the spiritual antitype of the Feast of Trumpets in the fall of Jerusalem and the return of Christ in AD 70. Thus, at the blowing of the trumpet in Matthew 24, the scene is set, Christ fulfilled the feast. Guess what month it was when Jerusalem fell? The Feast of Trumpets is celebrated the month of Tishri, which on the Gregorian calendar would be September or October. Okay? Tishri, that's when the Feast of Trumpets was. It just so happens, Josephus said, the city was taken on September 8th, A.D. 70, after the last siege had lasted about five months. So Feast of Trumpets is celebrated in Tishri. The Lord comes, the judgment in, in September in Tishri on this time for it. Listen, the judgment is all about Israel, and it happened in A.D. 70. This festal language, I think, is a very strong tie to Israel. They're their feast, not some future world judgment. Okay, let's move on in our text. For as was the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days, before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Okay, Yeshua drawing on a familiar judgment event from the Tanakh here, the flood. He's teaching by analogy, and this shows how the coming of the flood waters on his, were similar to what you're going to see in their situation. A coming judgment that they're not ready for. I mean, Noah's building the ark and everybody's laughing at him. He's, come on, you can come in the ark. No, we don't believe, we don't want any of that. They're building the ark. And then it started raining. And Noah put a bumper sticker on the ark that said, smile, God loves you. as they all perished in judgment, okay? He's drawing an analogy here, 
All right? He shows how the coming of the floodwaters and his own coming are similar. It's clear that Yeshua is still speaking about his coming and the destruction of Jerusalem. Twice he says, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. He's making a comparison between his coming and Noah's flood. As the flood came and took them all away, so the judgment on Israel will take them all away. The unbelievers of Israel, just like the unbelievers in Noah's day, were taken away in judgment. The Jews that weren't killed in AD 70 were taken into captivity. Now keep in mind what he was just talking about. He says, no one knows the day or the hour. The point that Yeshua is making is, just as in the days of Noah, the wicked didn't know until it started to rain. All right? And it came and took them all away. He said, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. In the days of Noah, they're eating and drinking, they're marrying and giving in marriage with no sense of apprehension about the coming flood. They laughed at Noah. So also would it be in those days prior to the destruction of Jerusalem. Now to the account of Noah, Luke adds a word about Sodom. He says, likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planning and building, but on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Now, in the case of both Noah and Lot, judgment came swiftly and completely on the unbelievers while the believers escaped. Just as in Lot, he escaped the fires of judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah by leaving the city so the Christians could, if they listened to Yeshua's words, and when they saw Jerusalem surrounded by armies, they got out of there. And Christians did. They fled to Pella. There was a break in the battle, and Christians took the Lord's word, and they got out. Now in verse 30, Luke mentions the Son of Man being revealed. Matthew 24 says the coming of the Son of Man. Both these expressions refer to the same thing. The parousia coming, his apocalypto revelation. In the destruction of Jerusalem, it was revealed to all that Yeshua was truly the Messiah of Israel. Jerusalem's destruction was a sign, as we saw earlier in this study, it was a sign that the Son of Man was in heaven. Luke 17, 31 says, On that day, let the one who was in the housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away. Likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. So Yeshua is warning his disciples that they could end up like Lot's wife if they didn't get out of Jerusalem quickly once they saw the abomination of desolation. He's also telling him they will be able to escape the judgment if they don't look back like Lot's wife did. And I think it should be obvious that it has no reference to a future coming where the earth is barbecued and all life ends. How did they escape from that? If he's talking about a destruction of the earth, everything's burned up, well, it doesn't matter if you're on your housetop or where you are, okay? It's total destruction. So that, there's no point in leaving and going anywhere. They couldn't. This reference to Noah and Sodom makes it clear this is not a reference to the annihilation of the universe. Human life on earth didn't end, but the wicked were judged and the righteous were spared. Matthew 24, 40 and 42 says, Then two men will be in a field. One will be taken, won't be left. Two women will be grinding at a mill. One will be taken, won't be left. Therefore stay awake, for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. These verses have absolutely nothing to do with the rapture. Okay? People go to this for rapture verse. See, one's taken away, he's raptured. No, that's not a reference to being caught up. It's to be taken in judgment. They're taken to judgment. Now, in case you doubt what I'm saying, again, let's go to Luke 17, 34 through 37. I tell you, in that night, there will be two in a bed. One will be taken, the other left. There will be two women grinding together. One will be taken, another one left. And they said to him, where, Lord? And he said to them, where the corpse is, there will the vultures gather. Does that sound like a rapture? If you remember our study in Matthew 24, verse 28, you remember this is a picture of judgment. They're taken away to judgment and slavery. They're not raptured to heaven. Now, in light of his coming in judgment on Jerusalem, Yeshua cautions his disciples, stay awake. Therefore, he says, stay awake, for you do not know what day your Lord is coming. All right, let's 
Who is he talking to here? Who is he talking to? His disciples, right? They asked a question. He's answering the question. It hasn't changed. Does it make any sense for Yeshua to urge his disciples, stay awake just 2,000 more years or so? Man, I don't know if I can stay awake that long, Lord. That's a long time to be staying awake. Why would he tell them that? Whether you translate that, stay awake, be alert, be on guard. There's no, if he's talking about the end of the world, how do they do it? Audience relevance. He's talking to his disciples, telling them to stay awake because it's coming quickly. And they're going to see it. It's going to be in their day. Bereans, you cannot divide Matthew 24. There's no indication that Yeshua is describing two separate comings and some period of time in between them. He's describing a coming, di- he's not describing a coming different than the one he described moments before using the same identical language on both sides of the place they want to split it. And I think it's pretty plain to someone who's honestly looking that you can't divide this chapter. So why is such a big effort to divide it? Well, I said, so they'll have some verses to speak of a future to us coming of Christ. They cannot let go of the traditional view of a coming of Christ in the future to destroy the earth. So they try to get two comings out of 24. But it cannot be done. He only spoke of one coming. That happened in AD 70. In reference to the judgment coming of Christ upon Jerusalem, notice again what Yeshua said. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, talking to His disciples about Jerusalem and their day, They're going to see it surrounded by armies. You see all these Roman armies all over the place. Then know that its desolation has come near. Does that make sense? Oh, look at the armies. We're in trouble. We're in trouble. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Why? Because they're destroying Jerusalem. If you go to the mountains, you'll be safe. It's not the earth that's being destroyed. The earth's being destroyed. Don't run anywhere. Let those who are inside the city depart. Now this is, this is counterintuitive. Jerusalem's a fortress. If you see an army, what do you want to do? Go to the fort. God's saying, nope, that fort's coming down. All right? If you're inside the city, depart. Let those who are out in the country, don't enter it. Why? For these are the days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. That's an important text, people. Yeshua said that the destruction of Jerusalem would fulfill all that was written. All prophecy was fulfilled when that city was destroyed. It was all fulfilled. There's no future coming. There's no prophecy yet to be fulfilled. It all happened. Now, there are some men who believe that all of Matthew 24 and 25 have been fulfilled and yet they still believe in a future coming of Christ. The desperation of this position was seen in John Bray's booklet, Yeshua is coming, or Jesus is coming soon. Mr. Bray says this, The New Testament references to the parousia coming of Christ had reference to that monumentous and single event which occurred in AD 70. The time statements in the New Testament prove this. Any reference to a future to us coming of Christ found in the New Testament, is found by inference and deduction and not by express statement. So Bray Bray is saying here, he's saying, I hold to a future coming of Christ. I don't have one scripture to support it, but I still believe it's going to happen. Well, not long after that, Bray threw that opinion out. He said, this is ridiculous. He realized how dumb that was, and he said, the Lord came, there's no more coming. It's done. Because he's he's saying here, all Scripture is talking about AD 70. So i got no Scripture, but I'm saying this is going to happen. How do you argue with someone like that? It's not in the Scripture, so we can't talk about the Scripture. I just believe it's going to happen. Okay, I guess you can believe whatever you want, right? But it has nothing to do with the Scripture. Well, like I said, Mr. Bray came to see that. No, that doesn't fit, and he gave up. Notice what Paul tells Timothy about the final judgment. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Yeshua, who is to judge the living and the dead by His appearing in His kingdom. So there's going to be a judgment coming. He's going to judge the living and the dead. Paul is telling Timothy it's going to happen, but you got to read it in Young's. Young says, I do fully testify 
that before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who is about to judge, because the word mellow is there, who is about to judge the living and dead. It's not in a couple thousand years you're going to judge him. He's about to do it. So Paul says that Christ is about to judge the living. He said this in the first century. Because it all happened in the first century. All prophecy was fulfilled in AD 70, in the day of God's wrath, just as Yeshua said it would be. And any idea of a third coming is speculation. And then there's not a shred of biblical backing to it. There's only one parousia talked about in the New Testament. That's the parousia that took place in the fall of Jerusalem. That brought about the fulfillment of all the promises that God made to the fathers. Where does the New Testament differentiate between two comings? Where does the Lord say, soon, quickly, near, shortly, and then say, far away, long, away, away time away? No, it's always a soon time reference. There's no need of a future coming, people, because it was all fulfilled. And here's the thing. You don't bring about an end of something that is eternal. Right? I mean, these, all these men would agree, we're in the New Covenant. So we're going to bring an end to the New Covenant? Why? It's an eternal covenant. Look at Hebrews 13, 20, 21. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Yeshua, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant. Eternal covenant. Equip you with everything good that you may do His will. Working in us that which is pleasing in His sight through Yeshua the Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. The new covenant, people, is an eternal covenant. It's an everlasting covenant. There's no end to it. It has no last days, no end times. There is no coming of Christ or judgment or resurrection in our future. Sorry to disappoint you. Okay? It's just not going to happen. Now, I said many times, all prophecy has been fulfilled. Let me try to explain this. Because when I say all prophecy has been fulfilled, and people say, then it's all over, everything's done. Well, for example, let's look at Jeremiah 3.17. At that time, Jerusalem shall be called the throne of Yahweh, and all nations shall gather to it, to the presence of Yahweh in Jerusalem, and they shall no more stubbornly follow their evil heart. He's taught, this is a prophecy that God is going to gather the nations. He's going to gather the Jews. He's going to bring everybody back into His fellowship. Those nations that had been cast out will come back. This is a prophecy. This prophecy was, began to be fulfilled at Pentecost when God was gathering the nations back together. But watch what Revelation 22.2 says. Through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now, when I say all prophecies have been fulfilled, the prophecy was fulfilled. Some of them are ongoing. The nations are still being called into the kingdom. The doors are never shut. All right, to the new Jerusalem. Believers are still coming in. They're trusting Christ. They're coming in. Outside, there's still dogs. There's still sorcerers. There's still whoremongers. So when I say a prophecy is fulfilled, that doesn't mean everything stopped. He fulfilled that prophecy. He called the nations back to Himself. Consummated at AD 70, but there's an ongoing sense. And that's why in the kingdom, it says in the Spirit and the bride say, come on! Let him who hears say, come! And let who's ever thirsty come take the water of life freely. Because it's ongoing. So it doesn't stop just because it's been fulfilled. Do you understand that? You're, am I making sense? And I'm trying to think of a word to use, but I couldn't figure it out. All right, It's been fulfilled, but it's Ongo I don't know. It's ongoing. It's not complete. It's still happening. The prophecy was fulfilled because the prophecy happened and it continues. They're coming in. They'll keep coming in. People have this idea that when the Lord comes, everything stops, everything's done, everything... No. Life is going on, people. The prophecies are fulfilled. That's what Luke said. I believe Luke meant it. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning for the opportunity to look at your word. I just pray, Lord, you give us the heart of Bereans and we'd examine these scriptures, not with preconceived notions, not trying to defend our own position, but to just see if they're so. Thank you, Lord, for your grace to us. I thank you for all that you've given us in this day and age that we can be students and dig deeply into your word. Give us a hunger to do that, Lord. Thank you for all you've given us. Amen.
Okay, that's good. I like that. Perpetual. My phone was blowing up here. Do what? I wasn't involved in. <laughs> What's today today? Well, this is November 1st, so I... Yeah. Yes, that's true. That was yesterday, right? Today? Okay, anybody got any questions? My phone was blowing up, but I can't find any text here, so... Uh, uh, like, Jeff must be something else. I'm... Okay. Gary? <laughs> He's telling his disciples to stay awake. Why stay awake? If it's the end of the world, and stay awake to get your affairs in order, but there's no reason to stay awake beyond that. Don't want to miss it. Once a lifetime event. Yeah, yeah, once it happens, I mean, yeah. Get the popcorn. And that, that's the thing. I mean, he says so clearly, Tuesday night. stay awake. I'm thinking, so for 2,000 years plus? That's a long wait. Even in their lifetime. Stay awake what for if it's the end of the world. Right, exactly. Well, to be, I guess, to watch for it. All right, I, I got a text here. It says, Mark 13 absolutely refutes the third coming scenario because in that account, the disciples only asked Yeshua when the temple would fall and what signs would precede the falling of the temple. They did not even ask about the end of the age world. And yet Yeshua answers the same as Matthew 24. Heaven and earth disappearing, the generation not passing away, the moons, etc., etc. How would Yeshua's answers mean the end of the world when he didn't even ask the question? I know, they didn't ask the question in Matthew either, but that's a good point. They didn't ask it in Luke. So that's not one of their questions, but somehow Gentry says, it's obvious that they're asking about the end of the world. I'm like, how do you get world out of that? Just don't get it. Because I wonder... <clears throat> yes. So there was the disciples. They were walking around with Jesus, you know, Luke and Matthew, and so. I, but I don't understand is uh, what I don't understand is how how you had it lined up from Matthew one two three four five and yeah. Luke and Luke two four one. Right. Why would they have different uh, opinions on on the order that it was? Because uh, I, I don't think the order was that important. Okay. The question is about the order, one Matthew and then Luke. The order is not important. They're all talking about the same thing. Okay? Here's the signs that you're going to see before this happens. And Luke gives the signs and Matthew gives the signs. But they're saying after 35, no. Well, well, Luke's got them after that. He's got them all mixed up. Just showing that that order is not really important. They all pointed to the same thing. Well, I don't have a group chat. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me see. I, no, I don't. He says the prophecies were about ushering in the ongoing condition of the new age. As far as you were saying, how they don't stop. It's all flexible right now. Okay, I see that. All right. Here, I'm getting in on the chat that I've been involved in that didn't know. Okay. <laughs> Um, Dan Harden says the prophecies were about ushering in the ongoing conditions of a new age. And that, I guess that's what I was trying to say. Not, couldn't get it out quite that way, but, you know, it's ongoing, you know, because I've been accused before. Well, all prophecy ended and everything's done. No, people are still being saved. The kingdom is still growing. People are being added to it. The nations are coming in. Gospel's going out. It's not over. Prophecy's fulfilled. The prophecy that predicted that has been fulfilled because it happened. David. I just give you, uh, you know, when I first got here, yeah, like yeah, I said, yeah, the first yeah, time yeah, I heard. The <laughs> what was that? He did it. Go, go ahead. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, like I said, I struggled with it for a year because when I first heard, like I said, well, you know, what planet is this guy from? And, and I, we still haven't probably, figured yeah. that out. <laughs> but, what, you know, I think the, the more you basically, you've been under the futurist, it really screws your mind up. Like you said in the Lord's Supper, it's only once God opens up your heart that you're going to see it. 
And, and the verse that really cemented it to me was Luke. I mean, Jesus is telling his disciples, flee to the mountains, and there is no mountains, so it's like... Yeah, people apply that to us today. And just ask them, what, okay, the Lord said this. What, what army are you looking for? Oh, that's Russia. That's China. You know, that's what oh, they say. They okay, where are we going to flee to? Which mountains? Which mountains we go to? Appalachia. <laughs> <laughs> go to Stanton, Virginia, to the mountains there? I don't know. That, I don't know if we get too much protection there. But. Mount Trashmore. Mount, Mount Trashmore. There we go. <laughs> that's, we're safe. <laughs> it's good to burn mountain. Mountain. People, you know, it's, like you said, either God opens people's eyes and they see this, or he doesn't and they don't. And, you know, that's all we can do is give information. I don't know why some people see it and some people don't. I have no clue why, but it's obvious that you can look at the same scriptures and come to different conclusions, you know. Could be because of preconceived notions, could be whatever. David? Hey, David. I know there's rarely ever a general consensus, but... I guess for people who see a fulfillment in 70 AD and look for a future fulfillment with that division, you know, like I've mentioned before, Revelation, what is their opinion on that? Is that 70 AD for them, or is it... Yes, I think they would put all that at 70 AD. So then, there again, you have another argument against their position, because if they say 36 is the divide for future destruction, but they say Revelation 1, because he's saying concerning that, that day and hour... And Revelation 1 is saying the Father is revealing right. that day and hour, which is soon because it's at hand. So um, I was just curious as to do they see that as a, as a future world destruction also? Because to me, those two line up right on the same subject. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptics, all have uh, all of a discourse in them. Why didn't John have one? Revelation. Because John wrote Revelation, and that's his all of his discourse, okay? <laughs> a long discourse on the destruction of Jerusalem. But that's what it's about. It's not about the earth. It's about Jerusalem. All right, we done? I think we are. Hey, you guys are making it too confusing by having uh, group chats over there. <laughs> Oh, was he? From, from everybody. No, I didn't. Okay. I thought that might be how you... No. Yeah, like last week, he's writing some of the book, and he wants arguments oh, okay. against okay. his division. And so I thought it was funny. Yeah. Well, well I, like I said, I, I've seen, I've read his arguments on 17, okay? And what he, Luke 17 and what he does with that, okay? But again, a strong argument to me is the festal language, all right? 